In this video, we'll discuss co-writing, what that means to write music with someone else, how you make the arrangement, the business arrangement of it, and as well as what can go right and wrong. We'll also discuss the performance rights organizations, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Songwriters belong to one of them, and these performance rights organizations pay the songwriter for performances of the music, so that's very important. To begin with co-writing, it is assumed that if you don't state otherwise, and there are two names on a copyright registration, that the agreement is 50-50. If I wrote all the music, and a person over here wrote all the words, then we're 50-50 owners, and I own half the words even though I wrote none of them. She owns half the music, even though she didn't write any of the music. But it's a 50-50 split, and that's if you didn't say anything and there are two names on it. What's very common, though, is for people to say, well, we're gonna work as a team, and let's write a few songs. Or let's write one song and see how it goes. And the issue that comes up is, did both people contribute equally? And how do they feel about this? This can get into sensitive issues as well. It can be feelings. You can't exactly quantize when two people have contributed music and lyrics. You can't literally say that was 49.6% and this was 51.4. You can't get into that perfectly. So you have to give an estimate. What most people will say is they'll agree that we're gonna be co-writers. The Beatles are a great example. Lennon and McCartney, realize that they're going to be, let's just say we're co-writers, we, we're 50-50 on everything. Paul's song, Getting Better, great song from Sgt. Pepper, he wrote it completely. John Lennon inserted one line, and it was great, it's very sarcastic, when Paul says, getting better all the time, and Lennon just says, couldn't get much worse. In terms of the number of words, that's not 50% of the words but it was just a really cool line. The Doors, famous American group from the 60s. Their first three albums, all compositions, all music and all compositions was by The Doors. So the four of them shared in the music. But later on, this had to become issues where, look, we're not all equal. From their fourth album and on, they decided to break it up and say, no, okay, these two wrote this song, this one person wrote that song. But these are the issues you have to kind of understand and know how you're gonna go about it. Are you gonna have a formal written document um, saying that's how this works? There are a lot of things that can go right and wrong with this. It could be you, you uh, again, do it after the song. You say, well, okay, I, I, just count me for 10%. I didn't do much. But that's one of the things that, that can happen with co-writing. When it comes to co-writing, another thing to consider is, well, how long is the copyright term? How long does copyright last? It lasts for, your lifetime plus 70 years after you're deceased. So if you write with someone, your work is gonna go for a long time and a lot, a lot of things can take place with it. Also, you reap the rewards, the benefits, and the disadvantages. Some problems can come from it. I'll give you an example without mentioning names. Four songwriters who are very well known uh, have a pretty well known, very well known song. The four of them are interesting people live in different places. One of the writers started not making intelligent choices in his life and started doing some foolish things. He, through the influence of his partner, started saying, you know, these people stole our song. The other three listened and said, they didn't steal our song, these songs aren't, aren't close. What's, what are you doing? But as, as one of the four writers, he had the right to go sue, to initiate a copyright infringement lawsuit against these other writers. And he did, and they lost quickly in a motion for summary judgment. And what happens is the, the other three writers who had nothing to do with it said, don't do this. They ended up having to pay significant court costs because of the action of one. It's just something that goes to show it could occur uh, that could be, a, that, that's kind of rare, but it can happen. Another thing that can happen is, say you go on to become co-writer with someone else, and that first person you co-wrote with might think, hey, that new song of yours is like the one we wrote 10 years ago. So you could also potentially be sued for infringing what you did earlier. It can get that complicated. Those are the worst case scenarios, but 
it's very helpful to know about them. When it comes to performance rights organizations, there's three in the United States, three primary ones. ASCAP is the one that's the oldest. It's been around since around 1909. It was formed by Broadway composers to make sure their music was being, uh, that whenever it was played, that they would be paid for it. And ASCAP was American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, is what the acronym stands for. But it was created for that kind of music. And they excluded a lot of music. They excluded jazz, blues, country. They didn't care. They were, they were more the, the Broadway, the higher paid composers. BMI came in 1939. It's Broadcast Music Incorporated. It was put together by radio companies. And they had a much different approach. They thought, let's do the music that ASCAP doesn't do. So they were more likely to get into country, folk, blues, jazz, and the music that ASCAP had ignored. In between those, in 1930, came CSAC, as a European company, and it's for-profit. ASCAP and BMI are non-profit, and so everything about them becomes public, it's the money they're making. CSAC is for-profit, it always has been, and they came to this country just to police copyrights. They were first saying the Americans were just stealing, they weren't paying royalties on music from Europeans. So that's what they started. But now all three, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, have so much in common. They're just trying to look out for their members and trying to get them paid. Say if you're an ASCAP writer and you want to write with a, a BMI writer, I, I, I definitely give this advice as something to try. And if your song has some success, whatever the level of success is, one of you is ASCAP, one of you is BMI. Well, when the checks come in, see what they are. They won't be the same because ASCAP and BMI and CSAC, they are very proprietary and secretive about how they calculate payments. If you're the ASCAP person working with the BMI person and the BMI person made a good amount of more money than you did, then you as the ASCAP person need to go to ASCAP and say, hey, look at this. We're co-writers, it's 50-50. Then ASCAP would likely raise the money, so it's the same, or tell you, well, okay, but we do this kind of performance differently. So when your music gets here, we'll pay more. They may pay more for television. They may pay more for certain radio stations. I mean, another thing to, to understand is the way the PROs work is if your music is played on New York radio on a Friday, that's better than New York City radio Tuesday at four in the morning. And that's better than the city of Boston, which is smaller than New York. And then you take Des Moines, Iowa, which is smaller than Boston. And you go on and on. So they have different rates for w what part of the country music's being played, how long it's being played, and so forth. So in conclusion, it's, it's very important to think before you get into co-writing to realize it, it is legal, whether you want to have a written document that uh, establishes the relationship and the songwriting splits, uh, that, that's a good idea. But whether you do or not, it is legal. And uh, there's so many advantages to co-writing, but it's good to know all around what the good things it can lead to and the mistakes that could occur from it.